Good morning. Um, great to see everyone. Uh, Happy New Year. Uh, Larry Gutterman, I'm uh, president of the uh, of the Brotherhood. Uh, this is our first uh, event of, uh, of 2021. Um, we're thrilled to have Rabbi Juan Mejia with us. Uh, I've been speaking with him uh, uh, a little bit. Um, so I just want to mention um, a little bit of uh, a little bit of programming uh, that's uh, that's coming up. That's that's out there. Um, there is uh, on uh, Sunday, the January 31st, uh, HOW talk series uh, with Adam K and Betsy Colbert, a uh, simple event. Um, following that, on uh, February 7th, uh, the scholar in residence, uh, Rabbi Zola, uh, will be uh, the temple for the weekend, and that Sunday morning. Uh, we'll be speaking uh, at the really at our next event. Uh, following that, uh, May seventh, uh, March seventh, excuse me, uh, our very own John Berger, uh, both Brotherhood and Temple board member, will uh, be uh, um, announcing and uh, discussing his new book. Uh, we're making arrangements to uh, have uh, signed copies of the book available, so stay tuned uh, for that. Uh, we have to we have to figure out how to do that remotely. Uh, following that, uh, the remainder of Brotherhood for this year, we have uh, on uh, April 18th, uh, our uh, member uh, Andrew Lackow has bought us a uh, 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 discussion about the uh, upcoming book, Crossfire Hurricane by uh, Josh Campbell. Uh, and then May 2nd, uh, Adam Deutsch uh, has been working heavily with the Innocence Project at Georgetown Law School, uh, has, a, uh, has a program in formation. So uh, we're, we're looking forward to uh, having you at, uh, at all these events. Uh, the February 7th event with Rabbi Zola is uh, actually a temple-wide uh, event. So um, to get out. Uh, rules, uh, rules about um, the, uh, the costs don't, uh, don't apply to that one. Um, so uh, with that said, um, uh, uh, today's, swear. today's speaker. If, uh, I thought I muted everyone, but I was getting some sound interference. Um, sounds better. Whoever's, uh, whoever's not muted should mute. Um, well, introduce, uh, today's, uh, today's speaker, uh, with us, uh, um, Rabbi Juan Mejia was born in Bogota, Colombia, raised a Catholic. He converted to Judaism after discovering the powerful beauty and message of Judaism. He held a degree in philosophy from Universidad Nacional de Colombia and a master's degree in Jewish civilization from Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Uh, he was ordained in 2009 by the Jewish Theological Seminary uh, in New York. He lives in Oklahoma City, where he serves as Jewish educator for Emmanuel Synagogue. He also serves as rabbi in residence for Bechol Lashon. Uh, Juan is a passionate advocate for converts, uh, Jews by choice, and making Torah available to all. Uh, he's been teaching Torah in Spanish for over a decade through his website, uh, Um we'll, uh, We could share that later. Uh, just a reminder uh, that uh, you should uh, please send your questions through the chat feature. Uh, and when the, when the rabbi is done uh, with his part of the, uh, uh, the talking, um, we'll, uh, we'll go through, uh, take the questions. Um, and uh, so without, without further ado, uh, Rabbi Mejia. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Marty. And thank you to all of the Larchman Temple Brotherhood for inviting me today. Uh, you can hear me okay? Good. Awesome. That was... Okay, I see myself now big. So I'm gonna tell you in the next uh, half hour, kind of like my own personal story, my approach to Judaism, the rabbinate, and what I do, and the, the beautiful world of possibilities that is just waiting on the edges of the map, literally, uh, for, for Jews. So <clears throat> as, as Larry told you, I was born a Catholic in Colombia um, over 40 years ago. I had a normal upbringing in Colombia, my parents were both, uh, my, my father was a doctor, so um, I had the opportunity of learning in an elite Catholic school for boys with Benedictine monks from North Dakota, hence the accent, uh, uh, that they, they taught me how to speak English, um, and, and, and have, be, have remained important spiritual uh, 
I get guiding stars till this day. Um, I don't know if they'll they'll take the credit, but I certainly credit them with with teaching me a lot about God and um, and what's right and what's wrong. So when I was 15 years old, um, I discovered that my family originally was Jewish. It happened very much by accident. We were spending Christmas at my father's uh, father, my my paternal grandfather, and my uncle started telling jokes. It was the, the, the atmosphere was, how shall we put it? Festive. Uh, and he started telling uh, jokes and the jokes started to uh, depreciate in quality. And he started telling like awful jokes. And then he started telling anti-Semitic jokes. And my grandfather got very upset. He said, you stop it right there. So why he's been trashing every ethnicity and religion and nationality for the past half an hour. And all of a sudden you get touchy. What is, what is going on? And he said, you can't tell jokes about Jews in this house. Like, what, what are you talking about? And I, I pushed and I pushed and I pushed and he finally spilled the beans. And he said, you know what? It, it's time you knew my grandfather was Jewish. So this is my paternal great, great grandfather. It's like, how do you know? Like, how were they Jewish? And so, well, they said they were Jewish. They lived in this isolated hacienda close to Medellin, actually. Um, we were talking about Medellin earlier. And nobody wanted to marry into the family because everybody knew that the Mejias were Jews. So they married cousins and they kept it in the family and they kept this secret alive. And he remembers when he was a young boy that the men of the family would gather in this room and say they would put towels on their heads. They would put towels over their heads and they would pray. And that was the only echo that he got. So I became very curious about Jewish history. Look, Colombia has very little Jews. When I was growing up, there may have been 4,000 Jews in the, in the entire country. It's a country of 40 million people. Uh, there's no Seinfeld. There's no Yiddish. Uh, people don't like, it's not the same as America. There's not the Hanukkah episode of like your favorite Colombian sitcoms. They don't have that. Jews don't exist. Jews are invisible. Everybody who lives in Bogota knows that that big building with the ton of guards outside and the golden dome, that's a synagogue, but nobody's been in there. So it was very hard to do this research. I didn't have any milestone. There was no one I could ask, but I finally pieced together the family history. And like many others, uh, I didn't know we were as many back then. Uh, my family were Sephardic Jews from Spain who chose to preserve some modicum of Jewish identity or and practice uh, while pretending to be Christian. This phenomenon has many, many names. Um, I'm not going to go into the details, Moranos, Crypto Jews, Sanusim. Um, and I became fascinated with Jewish history, not with Jewish religion, but with Jewish history. I started learning about Jewish history, always being of a nerdy persuasion. I The answer is in the books. Let's go read the books. But it was hard to get books about Judaism because Colombia, as I said, has very little Jews. There's not a lot of Jews about Judaism in Spanish. Then when I was 20, I, I took a break from college and I started traveling all over Europe. And I had the chance to spend three months in Israel. And that changed my outlook completely because now I've seen Jews. Before that, I, I, I knew one Jew. I'd met one Jew in my life until the end of age of 20. And it was like the neighbor of my best friend. And it was exotic. Oh my God, she has a bat mitzvah. Just say it's a, it's, it's a mythic party of epic proportions and I'm not invited. Uh, that was like my, my approach to Judaism. But here in Israel, I see Jews praying. I see Jews going to work. I see synagogues. I enter and leave. I, I, it was 98. So I could visit uh, areas that today would be very unsafe. And I felt this great sense of loss. It was not a happy reunion. Uh, amputees describe a, a phenomenon called the phantom limb is when you have an amputation Often for the first couple of weeks, you you have an itch in a foot or a, or a hand that you no longer have, right? It's, it's, it's in the mind. So here I started feeling my phantom Judaism. I've never been Jewish. I grew up a good Catholic boy, an altar boy for a while. I even considered becoming a priest. 
But all of a sudden I had like this longing for Judaism, a Judaism that I never had. So I go back to Colombia after this grand tour of Europe and I focus and like, okay, what does Judaism say? I've studied about Jews. Now I want to know what Jude Jews believe. And the more I study it, the more I said, this is what I've always believed. This is what I have, like, this is why I have, I get in trouble in religion class. I was never like many of my friends. I was never an, uh, an atheist. I was never an agnostic, but I was always frustrated as a young man of faith coming up and, and like my faith was not giving me the answers I needed. And I said like Judaism makes sense to me. The focus on practice, the focus on study, the focus on family, the focus on tradition and historical development. All of this speaks very strongly to me. I think I want to be Jewish. And then I start knocking on the doors of the synagogues in my city and they were not interested in me. I was very interested in them, but they were not interested in me. Latin American Judaism for many reasons, not chief among them, I would say security, but not exclusively security are very insular. They don't uh, promote themselves. They don't let people from the outside come in. Uh, and very, very, very rare cases do they convert someone. If there's a marriage, maybe to prevent intermarriage, may, they, will, they will do it. But like random kid shows up saying like, I have this family connection and I've studied so much and I love this. Can I please be part of you? They're not interested. Um, so when I finished my college, I, I said, I need to go somewhere where I can do this. And that somewhere was Israel. I ended up going to Hebrew U and I managed to, in the beginning, I was very... Um, adamant, I have to go Sephardic, 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 Sephardic is the right way. But then I started interacting with Orthodox Sephardic Judaism in Israel and coming with a strong background in philosophy, I did not click. Uh, there was a lot of traditions that I felt were like, this is, this is, this feels very Catholic to me. That feels like the, they're replicating some of the things that I don't like about Catholicism, like not being egalitarian, like, um, believe like, oh, if you pray to this like rabbi and he'll give you a Kabbalistic amulet, then you're going to get healed. Like, I am not interested in that. So that is how I discovered the conservative movement. I converted through the conservative movement in Israel, uh, enrolled in the conservative yeshiva, which is a fantastic institution of learning in Jerusalem. If you have not never heard of it, they have wonderful programs. You can go study for the summer for a year. If you've ever wanted to have like an egalitarian yeshiva experience, that is, in my opinion, the best place to do it. And there I met my wife. My wife, uh, who was an American uh, young woman who knew she wanted to go to rabbinical school, but was in Israel to get her Hebrew up to par and get like a good tech skills. So we got married. Um and I did not want to be a rabbi. I did not want to be a rabbi. Uh, I wanted to be in a PhD and be a boring PhD and like study Rambam and like middle age, like middle ages Jewish thinkers for the rest of my life. Um, and then while we were living and studying in yeshiva in Jerusalem, uh, I discovered that I was not alone, that I was indeed not the only Latino that was looking for their Jewish roots or for looking for Judaism. Um, I give an interview to my landlady uh, my landlady in Israel one day is like, Juan, she was, she was from New York, but now living in, how do you speak English so well? Like I went to Catholic school. It's like, how does a yeshiva bakar go to the Catholic school? I was not always a yeshiva bakar. And I told her my story. So that's a great story. Can I interview you? So she interviews me. And the next month I go to pay my rent. I go, I go to walk. She lived like three blocks from our house. So I walk my check to her. She said, you have fan mail. I'm like, what do you mean fan mail? So she works for the Sochnut, uh, the, the Jewish agency. And because she works for the Jewish agency, everything that's published on the website is published in Hebrew and Russian and French and English and Spanish. And a lot of people had found the article in Spanish and they sent me letters like, can you please send this to Juan? And the, and the email was the same email again and again and again. It was heartbreaking. It was, my name is Maria. I live in Nowheresville, Guatemala. My grandmother also lit candles. I don't know what to do with this. I want to learn more, but there's nowhere I can learn. How did you do it? Or my name is Moshe. I'm in Mexico City. I tried to buy Yom Kippur tickets to the shul and they called the cops on me. Like they didn't know what I was doing there. So they called the cops. 
And it was one story after another was heartbreaking. And I realized that there was more and more Latinos either interested in Judaism, interested in recovering their Jewish roots. Uh, and I was very troubled by this. And my wife said, you know what? She quoted Hill. I already told you she's the smartest rabbi I know. And she said, uh, she quoted Hillel to me. She said, in a place where there are no people, no mensch, you, you be that person. You, you, you can be a rabbi. You can be the rabbi these people need. And I say, but I want to be a boring like PhD person. So like, don't worry, rabbis can be boring too. And that is how I ended it into, uh, we ended up going together to JTS um, for five years. And I served pulpits in New York. And so, so did she, we were all around. And I always knew that I wanted to help, um, but I didn't know how. So towards the end of my rabbinical school years, I started teaching online. And this was over a decade ago. I started, I, I opened the YouTube channel. I started teaching online, said, come learn Mishnah with me. I'm a rabbinical student, Colombian rabbinical student in New York. And it started to, I started to be introduced to all of these group of amazing people. And that leads us from like Juan's story into what Juan does. And what does Juan do? Juan teaches internet online in Spanish. And I've created Cedarim, I created resources. And through this, I have been in touch. I've managed to, to discover this world. And I want to show you uh, glimpses of this world. Um, I think this is it. Yeah, here we go. This is a map of what I call emergent communities. What is an emergent community? An emergent community is a community of Jews in which the majority or the totality of its members are converts to Judaism. These are Jewish communities that pop out out of thin air, or not really out of thin air. Some people say, I used to be Jewish. I'm interested in Jewish. Some people, some of these communities, particularly in Africa and Asia, say that, oh, we have this connection. We're a lost tribe. So an emergent community might sound weird, but this is a phenomenon that has been consistent throughout Jewish history, but not as massive as it is today. Throughout Jewish history, there's been weird examples of communities that decide to convert to Judaism. So we have, during the time of the rabbis of the Mishnah, we had the royal house of Adiabin. Adiabin was in today Armenia. Like the queen and the king of Armenia converted to Judaism and a whole bunch of their, of their retinue. And they moved to Jerusalem. And they had like, during the Jewish war with Josephus, like Tisha B'Av, we had a cavalry division of Armenian soldiers fighting on our side because they had converted to Judaism. A lot of people have heard of the Kuzarim in the ninth century, ninth century uh, uh, central, the, the, like central Russia. They converted to Judaism. There was a community in the Balkans in the 16th century called the Sabbatarians. And in Russia, they're called the Subotniki. These were Protestants who, through their study of the Bible, became focused on the quote-unquote Old Testament and became kind of like veterotestamentarian, quote-unquote Jews. I, but they and they practiced that form of religion for five centuries until they were killed by the Nazis. When the Nazis invaded the Balkans, they said, "Jew, Sabbatarian, eh, y'all look enough to me. Let's go, yalla." In Italy, in the town of San Nicandro, if you can get this book, called, it's called The Jews of San Nicandro. It's this fascinating story of this town in the middle of fascist Italy that decides to convert to Judaism. In the middle of Mussolini's reign, they decide to convert to Judaism. So this is not a new thing. This has always happened, but today it's happening all over. So I'm going to give you a little bit of the map. Wherever you see a yellow dot, a yellow dot is an Orthodox leaning community. An Orthodox leaning community, you see there's a lot going on in Colombia. Uh, there's a lot going on in Ecuador and in Venezuela. Red are conservative leaning communities. Um these two are mine. You have communities all over the continent. You have communities in Africa, the Jews of Uganda, the Jews of Ghana, the Jews of Nigeria. And you also have reform-leaning communities who are in blue. 
And this is a map, this is a map that I have been compiling throughout the years. It is in no way, shape or form an extensive map, but it's really showing you the extent of people who are coming from without and they say, I want to be Jewish. I want to be Jewish. There's no Jewish community where I live. Let's create it together. Or, and this is also a sad but common trend, I want to be Jewish, but the Jewish community where I live, the people that live in the big cities, in Lima, in Mexico City, in Bogota, in Medellin, I want to be Jewish, but the Jewish community will not open its doors to me. So I have to create my own space. And all of these communities have contacts with rabbis. Most of these rabbis are in the United States, some in Israel. I think that the American rabbis have a, a far healthier approach to these communities. I think the rabbis from Israel have a very political approach to this. Like, oh, we want to bring people to Israel. We want to take them out of their countries and bring them to Israel, which although Aliyah is laudable, I don't think it's the best path for most of the people in these communities. But, but, but that is... Um, you can ask me about that later. So I would also show you uh, some pictures of some of these communities. I think pictures speak louder than words. Uh, and do you see the slide? Okay, I'm gonna show you three different communities. And these are communities that I am involved in, not, not directly all the time. Oh, Brrr, I'm gonna give you the, okay, here we go. Comunidad Bet Etz Chaim in Huanuco, Peru. Now, if you see this picture, these picture are, you see this guy right here? This, this, this. So uh, in the early 20th century, the greatest resource, the most expensive resource was rubber. Rubber. Mr. Ford was just pushing, pulling out. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can get everything that you need to build a car in Michigan. You have the wood, you have the iron, you have the workers, you have the parts. Mr. Ford had no problem building his cars in Michigan. He lacked one thing. He lacked rubber. He did not have rubber, does not grow in Michigan. Rubber grows in Peru, in the Amazon. And it became this boom town, boom, booming. And Jews from Poland, Jews from Lithuania moved in. Jews from Morocco moved in, into the Amazon to harvest rubber. This is a community of Ashkenazi Jews who settled in the Peruvian Andes and their job was schleppers. They would get things from the Pacific coast from Lima and they would put it on mules, take it over the mountains of the Andes and then go down to the, the heads of the rivers that feed into the Amazon and they would be like this, this communication line. Three generations, four generations later, these uh, recognizable Jewish pioneers, their descendants look like this. These guys are named Bauer and Bronstein and Bravo, like good, proper Ashkenazi names. This is the Bauer family, three generations of the Bauer family, but they had been forgotten. And they said, we want to go back. We know that we're not Jewish because there's been intermarriage and, 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 and they've lost the ability to, but they wanted to. The, the gingy guy is an American. Uh, his name is Daniel Schechter and he's a, he's a fantastic activist in this world and he was there teaching them and this is a bar mitzvah. So they're a reform community. Uh, so they're egalitarian, but but this this is their very humble synagogue up in the Andes. And this was the bar mitzvah, I think, of this guy. You see this laptop here? So this is a new way of us doing Judaism. But these people were connecting with their rabbi, who is a rabbi in Texas, uh, rabbi, oh. Their rabbi is in Texas. So they're, they're connecting with their rabbi. And this was 10 years ago. So, so what's normal for us now was the normal for them then. This, they're doing motzi, and this is one of the Torahs that, that has survived in the community. It was gathering moisture in an attic until finally they said, oh, I have a Jewish thing. Do you, do, could you guys use this? And it was a Torah. So this is a rich community of that has been disconnected from Judaism for three, four generations. And this is how they are choosing to reclaim their Judaism later. Um, this is a community that is under my supervision. 
Uh, this is called Shalom San Miguel. It's a, communi a mixed community in San Miguel de Allende in Mexico. Uh, why do I call it a mixed community? Because this community was originally a small shtibel of retired American Jews. San Miguel de Allende is this beautiful town in the mountains of Guanajuato. Beautiful, beautiful houses, this colonial gem in the mountains of Mexico. And a fifth of the people in this town are American expats. It's a great, the weather is nice. The houses are gorgeous. There's culture, there's music. Go visit. And there were shul, and there were Jews there, and they had the little shul in, 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 a, in a hotel. They got together for Pesach and the high holidays, and all of a sudden they get, excuse me, are you Jews? Yes, like, I've been looking for you. They won't let me into the synagogue in Mexico City. These were people who were taking a bus for six hours from Mexico City because they heard that up in the mountains there was these crazy American Jews that would let people from the street come and pray with them. And some of them were local, some of them were coming from the adjacent cities, and these being nice, older American Jews, right? These people had children, they had kinderlach, they had babies, and they went, absolutely welcome. And I have done seven conversion processes in San Miguel in the past 10 years. Uh, this is my rap, my, my... If I don't know who is Don Quixote and who's Sancho Panza, I think I fit the bill to be Sancho Panza a little bit better. I'm a little bit zaftiger. Uh, but this is my friend Danny Melman. He's an Argentinian rabbi from LA. This is Rabbi Felipe Goodman. He is the rabbi at Temple Beth Sholem in Las Vegas. So we're all Spanish speaking rabbis who are working in America and who don't have like a lot of the complications around conversion that our Latin American colleagues have. And this was our first batch in San Miguel. Since we've done over 120 conversions in this, in, this, in, this, in this town, the current president of the synagogue is a 31-year-old convert, psychologist, brilliant guy, Danny Torres. So this is a blended community. This was a community of elderly American Jews living in Mexico who all of a sudden were open to the possibility of renewal, of, of demographic renewal, and also these young people, these young Mexicans are bringing their food and they're bringing like Ladino songs because they want to take ownership of their Judaism in a profound way. So uh, this is the congregation uh, of, of like the, the, the original American Jews. Uh, and this was the first Jewish wedding in San Miguel in forever. So um, with, with this guy, who's this guy? I don't know this guy. I used, I used to have a big beard. Um, Judaism in the periphery, sometimes it's adventurous. So we don't have a, we didn't have a mikvah, we have a mikvah now. Uh, so we had to toivel the, the people for conversion in, in, this, in this spring. But we had to get there early because the native women come get there early to do their laundry. And it's, it's a very, like you're converting, you're naked, and you have like these women looking at you like you're crazy doing their laundry. So for the second time, this is the second batch, we, this is the sukkah of the community. And we had someone show up at five in the morning and set up the sukkah so people could have privacy while they immersed. And this is again, my friend, Danny Melman. This is Rabbi Gidon Estes from Houston. This is Dan Lesner, who used to be the president of the Chazan. And this was the second batch. So the first batch was seven people. The second batch, look at that. And there's like kids and these kids are bar mitzvahed already. Uh, um, this family made Aliyah and they're living in Israel. They made Aliyah like a year ago. Um, so, and more weddings. So that's Shalom San Miguel. That's a blended. These are not necessarily an emergent community there, but, but they have the possibility of how established communities could thrive with the right, um, with the right. This is my people. This, are my, this is my baby. This is my first community. This is Shirat Hayam in Santa Marta, Colombia. If you ever show up, if you ever go to Colombia to visit, please reach out. Larry has my email. Marty has my email. Remember this. Oh, I'm traveling. I want to go to a beach somewhere where it's pretty and cheap and nice and beautiful. Go to Santa Marta. Go to Colombia. It's, it's really gorgeous. Uh, these were a f bunch of people who had been for, for years, for like even like six years before I met them, had been trying to become Jewish. And they had been on and on again being swindled. 
First, it was messianic rabbis who were not even Jewish. They were not, and they were just preaching Christianity in a different garb. Then they connected with Orthodox rabbis in Israel who were telling them, you have to dress in like black and white, and you'd have to dress with like the long stockings. Santa Marta is hot. And, and the women didn't want to, like, they, they, the, the women were always very wary. They're like, this is not right for us. The men were very excited. Oh, yes, we have all these rights. But the women, so finally, one of some of these folks found my classes online. And we learned for two years. And I fell in love with them. And they fell in love with me. And we started working. And it took four years of us learning over six hours a week. Because when you convert in a synagogue, in a normal synagogue, well, there's a rabbi, there's a cantor, there's an educator, everything's done. But when you're converting in the vacuum, you need to learn how to pray, you need to learn Hebrew, you need to learn so much more. So the process took way longer. But this is uh, their first Rosh Hashanah. And as you see, a lot of kids, most of these kids are bar mitzvah. He currently is, I think, the only Jewish soldier in the Colombian armed forces. He just, got, he just got drafted. Colombia still has the draft. Old men have to serve for a year. But if you have money, and most Jews do have money, you can pay your way out. It's very like draft riots of 1864, if you, if you catch my drift. Uh, so he is currently the only Jewish soldier. He is serving his country in the middle of the Amazon jungle. And I don't know how I'm going to get him pass, uh, matzah for Pesach, but I will get him matzah in the middle of the jungle. That's my, that's my homework right now. Uh, this is my community. These are the adults, and they're a proud, conservative, egalitarian community. Um, this is their prayer space. Uh, and this is just, I wanted to show you some of the pictures. Now, and I want to finish because I'm sure you have questions. When I talk about this, um, people ask me, like, why? Why are these people doing this? And often with a, with a, uh, when I gave this in person, there was always like this puzzled look like, why would anybody in the right mind want to be Jewish? And the answer is because Judaism is amazing. Because Judaism is beautiful. Like a lot of people focus like, oh, is it because they are all descendants of Jews? And I'll give you, I'll give you a, 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 a believe me or don't believe me. This is certainly what, what my research of 15 years has 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 shown, and I, and I have good arguments, every Latino, every Latino that has a modicum of European heritage, which is most Latinos, because we are mestizo people, we're a mixture of native and European and black, I'm certainly that. Any Colombian, any Mexican, any Peruvian that has a modicum of European background has a modicum of Jewish background. 20% of the early settlers of Latin America were Sephardic Jews. 500 years later, that means everyone's a little Jewish. So no, it's not the genes that are pushing these people to do this. It's the beauty of Judaism. Right now, there is, um, there's many things pushing people into different religions. One thing in Latin America, at least, is Protestantism. When I was born, Colombia was 99.9% .9 Catholic. That was 40 years ago. Today, Colombia is 73% Catholic. That's in, 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 in a generation and a half, it's a net loss of almost 30%. What have these people chosen to be? Most of them have become evangelicals, Pentecostals, uh, but other people are trying different things, right? I have my WhatsApp group from my elite Catholic school from Bogota, and I know that this guy has become Hindu, and I've become, there's two Jews in my graduating class. There's like 10 evangelicals. So people have migrated. In America, this is the Pew Report, the Pew Report on religion, which whenever it comes out, everybody, go, everybody, Jews and Gentiles and Muslims go, Oy vey. they get really scared. What does the Pew Report tell us? 51 in two Americans dies in a different religion or denomination to the one that they were born. 50%. Yes, most of this is intra-religious migration, like people are born Catholic and they become Orthodox or they're born a Protestant and they become Catholic. But there's also people are dipping their fingers and their toes in other religions and other faiths. Why? Because of the internet. When I was looking for Judaism, I could not find books about Judaism in any bookstore in Bogota. So I turned, this is 1998, to the, the, the interwebs, and it was like dial-up connection. 
and that's how I learned Judaism. It was from the internet. Um, and that is certainly what is feeding this process. People become through process. Now every Colombian has a, a coworker, a friend, a boss, a son, a cousin that is no longer Catholic. And then they go, hmm, if I don't have to be Catholic, maybe I don't even have to be Christian. Let's see. I am dissatisfied with my faith. Let's see what's out there. So that is the motivation. And the internet provides the knowledge and the opportunity. Because now people can learn, and that is why I'm so invested in creating quality material of Judaism in Spanish. Because everything that's out there, it's either Lavavich or Messianic. It's Chabad, or it's or it's or it's people, or it's not Judaism at all. It's, it's it's evangelical Christianity dressed up as Judaism. So I try to colonize like the middle ground and offer a Judaism that is that is down to earth and that is actually practicable by people who don't live in Brooklyn or Me'a Sherim, which is kind of like what Chabad and, and Aisha Torah, for their great merits, but like the Judaism that they're propounding, oh, you need to keep super glot, triple glot, wrapped in glot, triple shrink wrap to be kosher, that is not possible in Colombia. Not even for Orthodox Jews who are living in Colombia. That's, that's not how you observe, that's what you observe in Brooklyn, and that is how you observe in Israel. So currently we have this and I will finish. Uh, okay. Um, so we have this incredible interest in Judaism from all around the world. Latin America is my expertise. It's the world I know the best, but it's not certainly the only one that there is. There's all around the world, people are rediscovering their Jewish roots or just saying like, this is what I want for my kids. And that is where I have flipped. When I began, I was very, very fascinated with like, I want to reach out people like me, people with, with a Sephardic background. But as I'm working for more than a decade in, in the field, I realized that everyone has a Sephardic background. And what I really want from you is commitment. So right now I was like, I don't care where your grandparents are. You don't have to have a Jewish gene to be interested in Judaism. You want to you wanna, wanna have this for your kids. I want, I'm more concerned if your grandchildren are going to be Jewish than if your grandparents are Jewish. Your grandparents are dead. Your, grand, your great-grandparents, certainly if we're talking 500 years ago, their, their story, how relevant, however relevant it might be to you, is not, is, is not a, a good enough reason to become Jewish. A good enough reason to become Jewish is... Um, is that Judaism is amazing. And that Judaism is this incredible toolbox for you and your descendants to deal with pandemics, to deal with anxiety, to deal with disconnection. That Shabbat, when you observe Shabbat, in whatever form you observe it, it makes your family life richer. It makes your family life better. So people are, are, are hooking up to Judaism. They're, they're, they're connecting to Judaism online. And... I'll tell you, I'll tell you a, a sad story. And with this, I'll finish, but it's a sad story with a happy ending. A year ago, this is January 2020, I was going to quit. I was going to quit. Why was I going to quit? Because I've been seeing your faces while I've been speaking. A lot of you have been smiling. Some of you, the ones I can see clearly think that this is a good thing, that people wanting to be Jewish, that new Jewish communities, that robust interested new Jews are a good thing, but the Jewish world does not seem to agree with me, right? My converts and many people like me still cannot enter certain Jewish communities in, Col in Colombia and in Mexico and Peru. It's still, they're still shunned. The, 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 the dynamics of these insular communities are very difficult. Not only that, but then because I'm a rabbi working from the outside, I get in trouble with my colleagues. They're like, whoa, you're coming here. You're doing like in my country, I'm staying out of your city, but like the, I'm working with people a thousand miles away. You have no jurisdiction over a town that's a, a thousand miles away that has no Jewish community. Israel has no interest in these communities whatsoever. Uh, 
I have a very sad story of a, of a, of a, of a pin that's on that map still, and I should remove it. There's a, a wonderful group that I work with. Nine people. It, 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 it started being a group of 50, but once I said, we're egalitarian, half people left. And like one, then one of the, of the remaining half said, I'm gay. And I didn't uh, like uh, uh, excommunicate him. And I was still like, okay, mazel tov, like, let's work with you. Uh, then the other guys left and I was left with nine people, but these were nine that were committed. They were doing Judaism in their living rooms. So wonderful. This was in Venezuela before things got bad. And then things started getting bad. And one of the women got cancer and the children were down to one meal a day. And would you believe me that it took me two years of writing emails six days a week on the phone with Israel, six days or two years to get these people to safety. I had to reconvert them. And I will, like, I will not give you the details of how I had to go and sit with the same rabbis, but in a different building for them to be deemed acceptable. So Latin America, Europe, Israel is not interested in this aspect of, of the Jewish world. Um, I think it's a foolish idea uh, because this is a wonderful way for Judaism to thrive. These communities are not only super excited about being Jewish, for them to be in contact with you, like for these communities to be invited now uh, to all of these COVID services, it's a, such a blessing. So I was about to quit and said, like, I'm converting people, I'm, I'm selling them, I'm selling them, I'm selling them a lie. I'm selling them a lie that if you convert in one of these communities, you're part of the Jewish people. You're clearly not. Because you can't make Aliyah, other Jews don't want to meet with you, you can't even go to their synagogues, no one recognizes you as Jewish in your local context, I'm done, I'm not going to do this to these people. And I was going to quit. And then COVID hit. And then all of a sudden, every, every Jewish community in the world is discovering the, the technologies that we had to develop to survive for the past decade. And like my folks were suddenly experts and they were being reached out like USCJ and other people like, can you help us like create a, a strategy of, of online community? And these communities stepped up. So now I'm more, and I didn't quit. And I've been trying to uh, figure out how this new reality, this new virtual reality can open possibilities for Jews all over the world who want in. And I know I've, I've gone Eight minutes over, uh, I time myself. That's the new reality. And I will answer the questions. Okay. Uh, All right. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Rabbi Medeer. That was, uh, um, that was, that was fabulous. Uh, so a, a bunch of questions have come in the past uh, few minutes. I will uh, take them in uh, uh, chronological order. A few of them I came in earlier. Uh, uh, one one person asks, uh, Rabbi, speak about the Jewish community in Eswara, Morocco. Are you I, I don't know a lot about Moroccan Judaism. Uh, there is a, a, a fantastic Colombo uh, American uh, Jew who now lives in Casablanca. Her name is Vanessa Paloma. She is a Sephardic Ladino. She's great. Like, look, look, all of her stuff. She's beautiful voice. She's done musicological work on the archives of the Jewish community. She's probably a better resource. What I know is that although small, the Jewish community in Morocco is safe. They have the blessing of the king. Uh, right now, there's a Kabbalist named Rabbi Pinto who's settled in next to the palace of the king. And he has like this following of ultra-Orthodox Israeli Jews who are now making pilgrimages to Morocco from Israel in the same way that like Israelis would go to Uman for Rabbi Nachman's uh, uh, yard site. Uh, they, they will go for Rosh Hashanah. So now people are going to Morocco and it's revitalizing a lot of these historical diaspora sites, which Rabbi Pinto is not my favorite rabbi, but, but, but certainly it's, it's an interesting model to see how Israelis are discovering diaspora. Like, oh, for like 60 years, well, we're now here. We need to forget where we came from. But, but the Jewish people is a global people, even with Israel, even with a strong America, even with this polarity of the two, like 
And no, nothing really changes. We've always had Babylonia and Israel. So we are now Babylonia. America is now Babylonia. We, we have like the big diaspora, but there's always all of these other peripheral places that hold Jewish meaning. And there's new places that can create Jewish meaning, or that can create new Jewish music and new Jewish food. So uh, if you reach out to, to Vanessa, she is, but I'm, 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 I'm mostly focused in Latin America too. But, but I'm sure the Jews in Morocco are, are, doing, are doing fine. Thank you. Um, before we go any further, I just want to thank our fellow member, uh, former Brotherhood President Stu Ross for uh, helping to bring you to us, uh, Rabbi. Um, My pleasure. Uh, so the next question, a uh, more personal one, what was your family's reaction uh, to your decision, to your path to convert to Judaism? Oy vey. Um, it's interesting. My mother's family is the more Catholic one, and they were not happy. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if they're fully okay with it until today. I, I'm married, I have three kids, and they're cute, and like that. That, that helps make things digestible. Um, my father's family, which is the Jewish side, was always more eclectic. So they, for they see it as they take pride in it. They take pride in it. So like, oh, finally somebody from the family did something strangely, and nothing, nothing connected. Of my three fathers' children, we are four, four siblings. Three of them are married to Jews. I'm the only one who's Jewish. But my 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 younger sister married an Argentinian Jew, and my older sister uh, is 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 a very busy doctor, and she is living with another very busy Jewish doctor in Bogota. So I don't know. My brother is still out. If we could do four by four, I think that would be that would be restorative justice for my family. But but um, <laughs> uh, in in a way. But but no, it's it it's it's difficult, and that is part of. One of the things that I am doing now with another bunch of a growing demographic that you might not know exists, which is convert rabbis. There is a growing number of converts inter entering the rabbinate. Uh, three years ago, a third of the incoming JTS class was converts. And that is going to really change how everything is done. One of the things that we're doing now as, as uh, kind of like one of my side projects is getting together with other convert rabbis and creating materials that address this. Look, this is, I, I can't vouch for the, for, the, for the statistics. They say that one in six American converts is, is a, it's one, one in six American Jews is a convert. One in six. That's, that's the only number I've heard. Maybe, maybe it's smaller. I don't know. Like there's, there's lies, there's big lies, and then there's statistics. But, but it's a statistic that it gives me hope that it's a growing demographic. And in the same way that 30 years ago, you had brave women who were getting together and creating like Batemi Drash and Jewish content that was specific to women because women were starting to get into the rabbinate and get more involved and taking positions of leadership in the rabbinate and synagogues. And then 10 years ago, you had the same awakening with LGBT Jews, right? Entering the rabbinate, creating queer Torah, creating uh, uh, what's called Svara Yeshiva in Chicago, which is a queer friendly yeshiva to learn Talmud. We are an independent tribe of the Jewish, no, I would not say independent, but we are a specific demographic in the Jewish people that nobody talks about. Because we have this Bubba Misa that, 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 that you can't talk about somebody converting and that it's this big secret, but we are being underserved. So right now I'm getting together with other convert rabbis and we're creating podcasts and videos to actually guide people. This is how you have the first meeting with a rabbi. This is how you have the Christmas conversation with your family. This is how you deal with uh, family saying you're going to hell. And, and like this is something that a born rabbi, a, a rabbi who's a Jew by birth, who has never had to explain to their family, look, I'm choosing a different path. So we're creating this kind of content for this demographic and being intentional about it, right? This is another tribe. Back in the day, we have the 12 tribes. Today, we have other kinds of tribes. We have different demographics within the Jewish people that deserve to be served specifically. So it was a, it was a hard conversation, but I, 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 I locked out. My family did not disown me. My family still talks to me. Um, they get, they get frustrated. Oh, what do you mean? We can't like, you, you can't turn on the TV on Saturday. Like, no, you turn on your TV. I'm going to be learning. I'm going to be playing with the kids outside. <laughs> Leave me alone. Uh, and Kashrut is <laughs> 
frustrating to them because everything in Colombian cuisine is strafe. It's it's like Colombian cuisine is 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 somebody trying to be as strafe as possible. Like we have bacon, okay, let's add milk to it, and then a bunch of cheese. It's it's like it's intentionally trying to be strafe. So that's that's really hard when I go to Colombia. Okay. Um, uh, along the lines of, uh, of, of tradition, do you know where in Europe uh, your your lineage is from? Yes, I have been able to trace my family all the way to 1380 to the city of Pedraza in Castile. Uh, the family is probably of northern origin um, of Galicia, but uh, before the, the 1391 pogroms, I located my family in Pedraza. Then they go to Villa Castin, which is next to Segovia. They converted before 1492, I'm pretty sure. They, these were not families who were like dragged, screaming into the baptismal font, as many were. These were people who said like, huh, I want to be a bishop and I want money and I want to keep my lands. I want to convert. And they did. Uh, uh, and, 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 and ancestors, well, not direct ancestors, but they were like the Bishop of Segovia and they were in, they were in the Cortes of Charles V of Spain. But then something very interesting happens in 1607, the family disappears from the peninsula. Part goes to Mexico, part goes to Colombia, part goes to Argentina, part goes to Cuba. And if, 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 if 1601, Philip III, the pious, uh, of Spain said, I'm done with these auto the face. I don't like, I don't, I don't want to hear about it. You want to leave, leave. Because before that you couldn't leave. If you didn't have pureza de sangre, you couldn't leave the country, but he gives seven years of amnesty. And that's when the Spinozas leave for Amsterdam. That's when the family of Menashe bin Israel, the great Dutch rabbi, that's when a lot of who would later become like the Morano, like the Anusim aristocracy of, of Amsterdam and of, London and through that of North American colonies, that's when they left Portugal and Spain. They left in that window from 1601 to 1608. My family left in 1607, landed in Colombia, and then retreated to the mountains to marry their cousins uh, for four generations until I came along. Just it's like Appalachia meets Spain in Colombia. It was very, very, very strange. And certainly my family has a uh, an interesting genetic uh, uh, heritage, to say the least. Um, okay, thank you. That's, that was fascinating. Um, the uh, I got a couple of questions here about the map. Actually, one questioner asked two separate questions. One, the first part of the question is: Why are there no new congregations in Uruguay, Argentina, or Chile? And the second one, which is kind of a follow-up. Um, I grew up as an anonymous Jew in Argentina. They were very close to newcomers and there was no kind of pedagogy or children's education. Is it the rule still? Could you give some information about Argentina? Yes, I can. The reason there's no stars or pins in the map in the in what we call the, the southern cone, el cono sur, it's like the bottom half of Latin America, which is Chile, Uruguay, and Argentina, which have a different dynamic. The northern part of South America is very blended. It's very mestizo. You had a lot of Indian, a lot of African heritage. The southern cone, because in the 19th century, the, the presidents and the leaders of these countries said, uh, we are really big countries and we don't have people. We need to import uh, like poor white Europeans. And they got like a lot of Italians and a lot of Spaniards and Jews as well, to settle in this country. So these countries are wider. They're more European than the northern part of Latin America. And they also have one thing that we don't have, which is large uh, critical masses of Jews. Argentina, Buenos Aires has something like 200,000 Jews. That is a good critical mass. Like an American city that has 200,000 Jews. I know New York is special, but New York is, is unique. But like 200,000 Jews is Houston. That is that 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 sets up you for that sets you up for 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 success. Many shuls, there's rabbinic seminaries, yeshivot, mikvahs, Jewish uh, Yiddish newspapers, Jewish printing houses. So they have a stronger um, they have a stronger critical mass, and therefore people that want to convert find it easier to do so. 
Uh, I, I still say that they're not as welcoming as a regular American community would be, but there is more opportunities. Where there is issues is in 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 the, the small towns like Southern Chile or like Southern Patagonia, where people are like, I want to convert. Like, there's no shul. Like, what do you do? So there's a little bit, but but not enough people are getting together to create a community. There's individuals all around the map, but I'm, I'm only putting pins in places that have actually organized communities. So they have a better Jewish uh, critical mass, more, more organization, so they can help these people better. But also, and here's a little bit of what, what you say, they're very close to newcomers and there was no kind of pedagogy for children. The Latin American Jewish community still has an ethnic bent to it. What do I mean by this? They still see themselves as we are from somewhere else, which is, I don't think, uh, it's hard for Americans to wrap our heads around it because we're so all about being American and like becoming good Americans and our hyphenated, our identity, and we're proud of that. And America allows for this. Latin America doesn't. If you are... Chinese Latin American, you're going to be called El Chino and your kids are going to be called El Chino. Like Fujimori is the, the past president of Peru. He's Japanese, but his kids, and he's always called El Chino, the Chinese. And actually it's, it's more, it's a slur. It's a Chinaman. It's, it's so Latin American countries really keep you in colonies and Latin American Jews still call themselves what you, you don't say I'm a member of a shul or I'm a member of the Jewish community. They say I'm a member of the Jewish colony, colony. And that's a different mentality. So I'm an ethnic enclave of a, of a people that's not from here. Right. And I mean, I might be as Argentinian as the rest and I drink mate and I follow Boca Juniors and I love soccer, but there's still a part of me that doesn't belong. When I walk the streets of Bogota with my keeper, which is probably a bad thing to do. I get questions like, where are you from? So it's like, I'm from here. Or where are your parents from? Like, they're also from here. Like the idea of a Colombian Jew is so foreign to the Colombians as it is like for the Jews. And that is like a tragedy of the colonial enterprise is that people get stuck. I'm not from here, but I'm not from another place, which is why so many Jews in Latin America leave. They either leave for Israel or they leave for Miami because they're being told since they're little, like, you're really not from here. And you really don't own anything to here. Like, we're, we're just passing. Just passing, like, just visiting, like in Monopoly. We're just visiting. We're not in jail. We're just visiting. Uh, so uh, I think education has improved in Argentina, but that ethnic landscape, ethnic, eth sorry, ethnic mindset really affects things because... Um, in like most of the Argent, most of the rabbis that serve in Latin American congregations are Argentinian. They're trained in Argentina. They're not. They don't know converts. Like they they think conversion is a thing to like. Oh, like Shmulek is marrying Maria. And we need to fix it. Like it's it, that is the framework for conversion, which is also true in some American communities. But they really don't see this as a possibility of a conscious choice a conscious religious choice. I think America is different. I think America is shifting. I think the, the ethnic narrative in America is closing a circle in the sense that we now, and by we, I mean my generation and the generations that are younger. I'm an exennial myself. I'm 44, but I see, I look at the, of the millennials. I look at the Zoomers. These guys, their ethnic, their, their ethnic loyalty is completely spread. They're, I'm Jewish, I'm Irish, I'm Mexican, I'm black, because a lot of these kids come from blended families, come from different traditions. So the ethnic component is not providing a good, um, a good uh, motivation to be Jewish. So what I focus on as an educator is meaning. Is meaning. This is a strategy for life. When you are sad, when you are depressed, when you are alone, when you are celebrating, these are Jewish modes in which you can do it. Independent of food, independent of history, these are tools for you to deal with life. 
And that is the, the gamble that I'm putting as, a, as an educator, but certainly in Oklahoma, like I look at my community. And when I say that this community has grown, my wife has been here for 11 years. She's done almost a hundred conversions also here. Only one was connected in any shape, way or form to a wedding. We are having emergent Jews here in Oklahoma. People who are dissatisfied with their religion and say like, I don't want to be Christian anymore. What's out there? And they Google and say like, wow, Judaism. And, they, and they're fantastic. They're members of, now members of our board, presidents, they're involved. They're my Hebrew school teachers. Um, but that is a reality in Oklahoma. And that's why I am, I'm leaning on meaning and, and leaning less on ethnicity because I've seen kind of like the, the limitations of that narrative towards the future, especially in America. Thanks. Um, I'm going to put a few more questions uh, together, um, maybe for you to speak to. Um, uh, so one question is, all, all religions can be found on the Internet. Why do the people you see go to Judaism? And then uh, I'll maybe maybe this is entirely fair. I'll pair that with an opposite question. Um, uh, curious if around these emergent communities, are there negative reactions from neighbors uh, and emergent anti-Semitism, as it were? Um, and maybe, uh, maybe you could speak to those, uh, those two points. Um, someone else asked the question, why do you think there is no interest in these remote communities? Okay. Sorry. I'm, I'm, I, I'm getting direct messages also on my chat. I don't know if you can see them. Uh, no, I can't. Okay. So let me answer these and then I'll answer like the ones that have been direct, directed to me. Can you remind me okay. the first one? <laughs> I'm trying to. Oh, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, all religions can be found on the internet. Why do people you see go to Judaism? It's not all, like, it's, like, the people that, the people that come to me are interested in Judaism. Like, uh, I like to give spilkas to people at the seminary when they ask me, like, why do you want to be when you're a rabbi? Like, there's the silly things that you do for donors. And I got in trouble because one's like, I want to be a missionary. And, like, the chancellor was there and he, uh, <laughs> he, choked on his potatoes. Um, and, and, and people misunderstand when they say, I'm, I don't want to knock on people's doors. If you're happy with your religion, that's, that's great. I, I, if anything, I'm an avowed pluralist. I believe that we all worship the same God. Uh, but it's like temperaments. Like some people like soccer, some people like football, some people like basketball. I don't care how you get your fitness, get your fitness wherever you get your fitness. Um, so the people that come to me are interested in Judaism. And I think that is, that is the model for um, outreach. Just put good material outside. Like uh, rabbis are now surprised, colleagues like, oh my God, now that my services are online, people are like, are chiming in from Indonesia and Peru. Like why? It's because the shuls in Peru and Indonesia don't let them in. There's no shuls in Indonesia. Well, there actually is, but they're emerging communities. So get rid, get get used to it. People are looking for Judaism, and you are putting it online. Like when a rabbi does a blog in Long Island, originally they thought, "Oh my God, I'm only reaching my congregation," but that's not how the internet works. I put a video online, and it goes everywhere. And people are going to watch it in India and people are going to watch it in Japan and people are going to watch it in Ghana. And if I can understand the language and I can connect to the meaning, then I'm in, I'm looking for it. Right. So that is, um, there's interest in everything right now, as we have emergent synagogues in Latin America, we have emergent mosques and we have emergent uh, Hindu temples and little gudwaras of Sikh and little uh, there's this guy who went to college with me in the, in Universidad Nacional and he became a Zen monk and he has like this little Zen temple in Bogota like downtown and he has he's doing he's doing great he's he's making lots of students this is the zeitgeist of 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 the age this is the people are looking for meaning those who want Jewish meaning will find it. If, if they speak Spanish, they will find me, hopefully. And if they resonate, then they'll get to work with me. Um, why, why the interest in Judaism? I think, and this is me talking with the objectivity of someone who has been in another religion. I think we do most things in a more nuanced way. I think the Jewish toolbox is bigger. We have dealt with rootlessness 
and rootedness. We have dealt with great power and we have dealt with absolute powerlessness in the Shoah. And all of that is part of our toolbox. So why wouldn't I want to give my kid a toolbox for life that gives you, look, here are the midrashim, these are the texts, these are the traditions, these are the, the ceremonies that you do when you are winning, but these are also the reminders that you can lose. I don't see that in, in Christianity, certainly, or Islam, which is all about we win. We shall emerge victorious. I will achieve everything in Christ that strengthens me. And then when Christians don't get their way, and there's a lot of right of that happening right now here in Oklahoma, without the intention of making a political argument, many of my neighbors voted for the guy who lost. And theologically now they're going nuts because their pastors are telling them, we are victorious, God wills it. And I think we Jews deal better with tragedy, big surprise. But also our, our tools for dealing with victory are a little bit more nuanced. We don't want to rule the world. We just want like our 40 acres and our donkey, like leave us alone. We just give us like our 40 acres in, in the land of Israel and, and we shall produce good, good culture that will move the, the world forward. We don't need to rule the world. We don't need to win at the end. This does not need to be. And in the end, like Jesus will come victorious or the Mahdi will come victorious. Like, okay, Mashiach, I'm not a big uh, I, I don't put a lot of, uh, uh, my, my, my investment portfolio is not Mashiach centered. Uh, and I think that's because I used to be Christian and the idea of like a, a cosmic settler sits very poorly with me. Um, but I think for a certain kind of people, Judaism offers everything they need as other faiths will do for other people. Um, okay. Um, I, I have a series of questions, and maybe you've seen some of them, um, that go along the lines of what can we do to help uh, or support, uh, I guess, emergent communities or, or your efforts? Um, what can we do to help? Um, the first thing is knowing, knowing that this exists. Like, I think that, like, that has been my mitzvah. I have been very vocal for the past 15 years, at least, in the conservative rabbinate. And now when Pedro in... Tucson shows up at the office of one of my colleagues, they'll go, oh, this guy's just like Juan. Great, Juan's not too bad. Let's let Pedro in, right? Uh, like, so just knowing that this exists, knowing that this path to Judaism exists is, is already a great step forward. Um, when this is over, when this is over, when you're planning a vacation, and you're going to a weird place on, in the world, check out Bechol Lashon, reach out to me. If you're going to South America, please reach out to me and I'll tell you, you know what? You're going to Guatemala, you gotta meet these folks and I'll hook you up and I'll do that shidduch. And then when you're going to vacation in Guatemala and you see the lakes and the volcanoes and the good things to see, you get to spend Shabbos with the local Jews and they will steal your heart and you will make friends. And for them, this is what they have to win. These communities, they don't really need that much money. They are they're they're in a they're chavurot. They're meeting in 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 living rooms and garages. The bigger ones are starting to rent properties. They are where probably the Larchman Temple was a hundred years ago, right? A bunch of or I don't know how old their synagogue is. My synagogue is a hundred years old, uh, one hundred and twenty years old, and they started meeting in the back store of a, of of a guy named Manny in 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 downtown Oklahoma City, like after it was settled in one day by land run. That's how my, my city came to be with mm -hmm. crazy people running in horses. We have a statue of it for it. Um, Sooners. Right, Sooners. We have a, this is the Sooner state. Um, so they're in that stage. What they need is love. What they need is a Jew going on and saying, I recognize you. I see you and you are, you are also Jewish. And what you have is beautiful. And here is what I have. Is They're me needing that connection. Um, when, when, when this is over, go. Um, just inform and, and, and like open your mind of, of the possibilities of the Jewish future. Right now we think that 
the possibility of the Jewish future is kind of Israel and America chugging along kind of like this train, like uphill train against the forces of assimilation and, and all those things. Yes, that is happening right now, but there's also this other story of people that with this incredible willingness and love are adopting Judaism. They're adopting, they're opening to Judaism and say like, yes, this is it. And that joy is contagious. And also you, there's this line in the Megillah that I take to heart, which is when Mordechai tells Esther, if you don't do this, salvation will come from another source. Salvation will come from another source. 360 odd years ago, 14 Jews got off the ship in New Amsterdam. There were three men, the rest were women and children. And if you were there to meet them at the port in downtown Manhattan and tell them, welcome to New Amsterdam, you guys are founding the most amazing diaspora the world has ever seen. They would laugh at your face. Like, we're in the middle of the jungle because that was what Manhattan was, right? The, the city ended in Wall Street. There here be monsters after that. Where you guys were, I don't even, like, Larchman was probably a Lenape village. And it's like, really? We are, we're founding what? I don't know if 300 years in the future, my communities are going to be like the founders of the next kind of like branch of Jewish history. But we have to diversify. We do not need to put all of our eggs in the same basket of America or Israel. Why? Because this message is universal. Thanks. Um, I, I think we're nearing the end. Um, the, uh, I'll just share uh, one of our questioners uh, wrote about his, uh, his own family's experience, uh, his um, uh, father being a, being a rabbi, uh, bringing, bringing Torahs and Judaism in the 1950s through the 1980s, in his words, had some of the same troubles you have. Um, so he was asking about the, how can we help? Uh, I was very touched by your answer, um, by the way. Um, and uh, we'll certainly keep you in mind, should I find myself traveling in that if direction? You want to, or if you want to connect with these kids, the, the only problem is their English is very limited. Their English is mm -hmm. very limited. But you know what? I'm going to do something. I'm going to send you a, uh, a link. It's a YouTube link. I, I can't play it right now because um, I need to get back to, to Sunday school. Uh, yeah. But but I want you and to share. And our computers will crash if we play YouTube uh, now. <laughs> and uh, uh, and it's the music that they do is their Adon Olam. So so mm -hmm. you can see like it's not just that these like a lot of a lot of a lot of the of the attitudes toward these communities sometimes can be a little bit paternalistic like oh let me send you a bunch of like old kippot from like a bar mitzvah and, and that's great they need kippot because you know, can't mm -hmm. buy kippot in colombia or like old talitot or sidurim like sidurim is not a big issue because sidurim they, they don't read english so but they're not just consumers of judaism a lot of these communities have been working so much so for so long that they're now awesome producers of judaism case in point my favorite emerging community which is not latin america is in uganda if you've never heard of the ugandan jews google them today the ugandan jewish community has six synagogues a yeshiva a hospital in the middle of the ugandan bush there are conservative wow. communities. The rabbi was ordained by the University of Judaism. And their music is mind-blowing because they take like the normal suburban Aleinu of, of North American congregations, which is where Rabbi Gershom, the rabbi trained, but they Africanize it. And it's so beautiful to hear something that's familiar, but at the same time exotic. Uh, uh, just listen to this music, reach, reach expand kind of like the, the global reach of your community to, to include even as distant cousins, these people. Um, Larry, I, I will quickly answer some of the private questions. Very like, I, I will like 30 seconds each. Why is what? Barcelona in the map? Barcelona is in the map because until very recently, Anusim, people with Sephardic backgrounds, were not welcome in the established synagogues in Barcelona. So they had to create their own since they have been included in the World Union and Masorti Olami, but that is a recent development. Spain has seen a great, like there's uh, been five communities that have been developed in the past decade. 
Uh, and again, most of these are small communities of converts in Cordoba, in uh, Asturias, in Barcelona, um, all over the peninsula. They've been reaching out and things are starting to change in Spain. Things are starting to change in Spain. Um, is there a revival of Ladino? Uh, partial. There's a partial revival of Ladino. A uh, Ladino being a form of Spanish gives these communities a way to feel historical without like, it's easy for them because they understand it. The music is beautiful. Um, there is a, a lot of also boobamizes around it. Like, oh, my ancestors spoke Ladino. That is That is not true. Ladino developed in the Turkish empire and it's a newer language than people think. Your ancestors spoke Spanish like their neighbors did. Uh, uh, and it was a, a, a Spanish that kind of sounded like Ladino. I see no problem in these communities co-opting Ladino as a way to build uh, Latino Jewish identity. But what I do tell them is, point is not going back to 1491. 1491, we don't really know what Spanish Jewry looked like in 1491. There was a lot of diversity, right? Barcelona, Girona was not the same as Andalusia. So you be Mexican. You find a way to how to be Mexican and Jewish. Find a way to be Peruvian and Jewish. And if these Ladino songs help you build that, then take them in. Um, there is, uh, for the person who asked about Italy, I would uh, invite you to look the work of Rabbi Barbara Aiello, who's been doing a lot of work in Southern Italy as well uh, with historical communities of Bene Anusim that remained in Italy. Um, this is really happening all over, all over. The World Union of Progressive Judaism, the reform movement has been doing a better job, I think, than us uh, currently they have four emergent communities affiliated to their movement. Uh, we only have two, which is Uganda and my own. And I had to fight tooth and nail to get my communities recognized. So the reform in this are, are slightly better than we are. I hope that through my work and other allies, uh, we make this also a conservative cause to, to, to espouse. Thank you for mentioning WPJ. And I think that covers all of the private questions. Okay. Yeah. No, I think we've. Uh, I, I think we've gone through it. Um, so, uh, I want to thank you very much for uh, for your time with us. Uh, very, uh, very illuminating uh, discussion. Um, and uh, uh, so we'll end in a moment. Um, I uh, um, you know, do forward the uh, information. We'll share it with the. Uh, uh, with the membership uh, with the temple. Um, I see you've just sent your uh, Gmail address to uh, everyone. Uh, if anyone doesn't know, you can save your chat by hitting the uh, three buttons in the chat window. Uh, and hit save chat. Um, and uh, uh, all, all that was in your chat feed will be memorialized uh, on your computer. Um, uh, Rabbi, Rabbi Mejia, um, thank you very much for uh, your, uh, your time with us today. My nice. honor, Thanks. my pleasure. Everybody stay safe. We're almost out of this one. Hang in tight, New York. I know that New York and Oklahoma are very different, but, but, but certainly uh, from, from this small synagogue in the prairies, we, we keep you, we think about you. Uh, we want you all to be safe. Please give a listen to this YouTube video. You will not regret it. It's the Adon Alam as done by one of my Colombian communities. Uh, and I think you'll, you'll find it quite illuminating and really a, a taste of the Judaism, the vibrant, exciting Judaism that these communities can produce. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And if you're ever in Oklahoma, please do give us a visit. Thank you. You can and wh you. whoever's yes, son yes. is here in Oklahoma yes, City. Yes. yes, please email me. We will hook him up. Yes, yes. yes I will. Thank you. Toda. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye.